Oh, how well I remember a television show called Sing Along with Mitch. I mean, now we're, we're so worried about special effects and, and uh, production values and shows that cost hundreds of millions of, of dollars to produce so we can see some giant army in the snow, snowy wilderness and dragons and everything else. And since I never got started on that show, I didn't care how it ended and it was immune to all the spoilers. But Sing Along with Mitch was was Mitch Miller and the band and the singers and people, and they would project the lyrics on the TV screen. That was high tech. And a little bouncing ball would tell you what syllable you were on, and you were supposed to sing along. Follow the bouncing ball. And uh, we did. It was, we would sit transfixed at people singing and in our little rooms, we would sing along with the black and white screen. The bear went over the mountain. The bear went over the mountain. The bear went over the mountain to see what he could see. And all that he could see, and all that he could see was the other side of the mountain. The other side of the mountain, the other side of the mountain, was all that he could see. Anybody here that's younger is thinking, didn't they have anything to do <laughs> on Sunday night? But we sang along with Mitch. Now, I have to say, that song kind of kind of misses the point, because climbing up to the mountain, we have a tremendous perspective. If, if you think of your summer journey as I unraveled that river journey for the children, when you think of the places you went, you saw stuff, and you saw a different world. Certainly, if you, if you want to to get a perspective of what you can see when you're up high, I, I invite you to corner Travis later and ask him to show you a few of the photographs he showed me before church of, of what it looks like when you're way up high. And uh, uh, it's certainly eye-opening. But maybe we're conditioned to think of what our perspective should be like up high, I think of time spent at the Grand Canyon before, of Pikes Peak, or even just Mount Trashmore nearby, getting up a little higher and looking around. But you also get a tremendous perspective when, when things are dark and hemmed in and gloomy. And I want to suggest that that Paul and Silas saw more clearly when they're thrown into the deepest, darkest part of the jail, chained, unable to move, because they're able to sing songs of salvation. And I want to remind you that the word for salvation and saved in the New Testament also means well and whole, and at peace. All of those words are combined. Is that possible? Is it, is it possible for Paul and Silas to sing when it's dark? I want to suggest that, that it shows in history that it is. Now, first of all, why are they there? Paul is there, not because he's preaching some strange religion that, that is just the opposite of Roman practices, despite the accusations that are thrown at him in the scripture. He's there because he cost people money. There is a woman who has a spirit of prophecy, whatever that means, and the one thing she sees clearly is that these people are preaching about Jesus, the Son of God, 
who brings wholeness and health and wellness. And when Paul gets tired of hearing her, he casts that spirit out. Now, what happened is, what really happens that, da- that is dangerous is that this woman is a slave in plain sight. And I submit to you that modern-day slavery is in plain sight, and we don't see it, and we don't want to. That there are people in bondage, economically, working three jobs in our own society and unable to make ends meet, and we don't want to see that. We're happy with employment figures. We say, oh, look, unemployment is down. And we don't want to know that there are single mothers who are struggling. We don't want to hear their voices. I want to suggest that there are people who are held in bondage because they can barely make all their prescription costs for all the pain all the demons that ail them. And they don't know whether to buy food or to get their drugs in our society. We don't want to see them. And if somebody brings them to our attention, we are just as angry as those who put Paul in prison. And certainly there is actual slavery in our society. People who are making your clothes. People who are kidnapped and part of the sex trade. And we don't want that to exist, so we pretend it doesn't. And we get annoyed when it's brought to our attention. Not in our society. There's nobody hungry. Anybody can have a job. So Paul is in prison. Just like, as we read in the martyr's mirror, those people who felt that it was okay to meet in their own homes for a Bible study, those people who felt that they could go to the church of their choice and were tortured and brutally and publicly executed by fire, and by torture and other means because they dared to stand up against the established government and churches. Algerius, who was a young person martyred in Italy, wrote, in this dark hole I have found pleasure, in a place of bitterness and death, rest and hope of salvation, in the abyss or depths of hell, joy, Where others weep, I have laughed. Where others fear, I have found strength. Who will believe this? In a state of misery, I have had very great delight. In a lonely corner, I have found most glorious company. And in the severest bond, great rest. All these things, my fellow brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, the gracious hand of God has given me. Behold, he that at first was far from me is now with me. And him who I knew but a little, I now see clearly. To whom I once looked from afar, him I now behold as present. He for whom I long now offers me his hand. He comforts me. He fills me with joy. How sweet the Lord is. How faithful and merciful, who visits his servants in trial. And here he was quoting from Isaiah. Who humbles himself and condescends to be with us in our humble abodes. Algerius had discovered, as one of those who sang in a deep and dark prison, and who was murdered for his faith, that God is with us like God was with Paul and Silas. And again, recently, when I read the three-part comic book called March by John Lewis, who serves in Congress now and who was beat about the head mercilessly and hospitalized for weeks 
from the injuries to his head. And when you see him today, still bears the marks. In that comic book, he tells the story that the civil rights movement was more than just a woman who sat down in one part of the bus or a preacher who stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial and said, I have a dream, though those are very powerful. The stories of those who were determined to love their enemies, who were taught to love their enemies and respond nonviolently when people blew up churches with children in the basement or shot children riding their bicycles. Again and again, we hear the story of children murdered knowing they would not be convicted in their courts, that they would be acquitted, and that there was no recourse for the violence against them, and so they responded with nonviolence and with love. In public places, being attacked by police dogs, hosed down with fire hoses, and beaten by authorities with batons around their head, Many died. Those who survived bore great injuries. And yet again and again we see in their story how they sang in prison like Paul and Silas and changed the world, struck consciences. You know, when, when there was the jailhouse rock, when the jailhouse rocked in this story and Paul and Silas were set free, the jailer who had put them in the worst part of the jail, prepared to commit suicide because he expected that he would have to suffer whatever it was that they were planning to do to his prisoners. And instead he found that they, they said, we're here, don't worry. You matter more than us. When we put others more, higher than us, when we put those who hate us higher than us, They are astounded. And the jailer says, what must I do to be saved? And remember, what does that word really mean? It also means, what must I do to be well? To no longer be a part of what our society says is important. What must I do to be like Jesus? To live like Jesus? And soon they are not only baptized, but they are they are. The prisoners who are wounded receive medical aid and are seated at the table with the family. That's the goal, that we will be at one table. Not that we will continue to be divided, hating each other, suspicious of each other, sure that the others are always wrong, but that we will laugh like it's a family reunion and pass the casseroles and eat at the same table, not in separate places. That's what happens when everything is rocked by the earthquake of love. That's why Paul can sing in prison with Silas. That's why the civil rights marchers could sing in the southern jails as they were mistreated and beaten. That's why in the thousands of pages in the martyr's mirror, the people can witness with love to the hatred of their tormentors. It's because it's really about the other person who hates us more than it's about us. I started by talking about that bear on top of the mountain. Now, I'll tell you what, that bear was, was, was too smart to take a selfie of himself on the edge. I, I mean, no disrespect to those people who died so tragically because they were trying to take a picture of themselves up at a great height. When it's all about looking not at ourselves, but others, or about what surrounds us. Let's look at what surrounds us. Let's see the suffering people in our midst who aren't making it work right now for medical reasons, for economic reasons, for spiritual reasons. And let's find a way to share the peace that we have come to found. Not, not the tranquility, prosperity, not, not the security, which we haven't found. Anyone who's looking at their field and realizing, when am I going to plant, knows that 
that the security we think we have may not be there. But we can still be at peace. We can be whole because we see something greater. We stand up higher. We look farther. Even if we're at sea level, we know there's something greater. The let's look with our eyes. Let's see what we can see. Because on the other side of the mountain is a place where we will break bread. Like it says in the psalm, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. What that means, you don't have a table in front of people unless you're going to sit and eat with them. That is the vision of peace and wholeness in Psalm 23, in scriptures, and in that jail cell in Acts, to come to a place where we are finally one people in Christ, in love, in shalom, in peace. Amen.